Good evening to everyone joining us uh, uh, tonight on the uh, FJMC Zoom network for another outstanding webinar presentation uh, focusing on mental illness. And more on that in just a moment. Before we get too far along this evening, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Steve Sturman, the chair of FJMC's Inclusion Committee, who is on the call this evening. You will be hearing uh, more about the committee's planned activities in the weeks to come. And uh, Steve is on the call, and we thank him very much for participating and attending tonight's program. Our presenter this evening is Mary Madden, who has served as executive director of NAMI Southeast Wisconsin since 2008. NAMI is the National Alliance of Mental Illness, a national organization. Under her leadership, Southeast Wisconsin, NAMI Southeast Wisconsin has gone from a small organization serving Waukesha County in Wisconsin to a large full service uh, organization providing services in Milwaukee, Waukesha and Jefferson counties in the state of Wisconsin. Among others, she has added programs that help educate law enforcement and crisis intervention and de-escalation and programs that serve individuals experiencing homelessness in Waukesha County. Uh, she helped secure a three-year grant to establish the United for Waukesha Resiliency Center to support victims of the 2021 Waukesha Parade tragedy that uh, was during that Thanksgiving holiday uh, period uh, in 2021. Uh, she also uh, recently participated in person as a uh, guest presenter at the FJMC Midwest Region uh, Breakfast that was held in uh, Glendale, Wisconsin, hosted by Congregation Beth Israel Nair Tamid. And uh, she braved the elements and came out. It was 15 below zero. And she was there, ready to go and prepared. And we had a great uh, presentation. Uh, she's added some new elements to this uh, program tonight, which I am, am certain that everyone will be uh, pleased to see. So uh, I'd like to introduce and present Mary Madden, Executive Director of NAMI Southeast Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Norwin. So um, what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to do a little bit of Mental Health 101 and um and and talk about nami and the services we provide and then um there's a couple of uh things we're going to uh talk about in regard to some environmental factors and um you know uh special things to attend to with our kids who are at risk so um, just to start out, um, NAMI is a national grassroots organization that was founded by parents in 1979, and everything that we uh, provide um, is free um, of charge to those who seek the services, and we all do it all through a lived experience perspective. So I myself am a family member with loved ones who live um, with mental health conditions, and um, we have staff who live in recovery with their own mental illnesses. And so um, that is one of the things that really makes NAMI unique is that it's we are bringing things to you from that lived uh, experience lens. Uh, many of our programs are evidence-based programs um, that improve outcomes. And it's really a community-based approach to addressing those growing needs, um, those growing mental health needs. There are um, more than 600 NAMI state organizations and affiliates across the country. Um, we also have one in Puerto Rico and there's a small um, organization up in Canada as well. Um, and a little bit later in the presentation, I'm gonna take you to uh, the Nash this website where we can see um, you know, really how to navigate finding your own NAMI. But first we're gonna talk about um, you know, what mental illness is and um, how we can help. Our mission and vision, um, and, and by the way, I will make these um, slides available so that um, people are able to go back and look at them. And if there's things we moved through quickly, um, you can go back and review them. But the mission and vision of each NAMI is going to read slightly different 
However, we all do things under the same bucket of providing support, education, and advocacy for people impacted by mental health conditions. So understanding mental health. Um, really, you know, mental health can be on a spectrum and it's, it's, it really goes beyond just the absence of an illness. And I would uh, venture to guess that most of us, um, you know, understand what it's like to feel really mentally well. And then some days not so mentally well, um, you hear, uh, people refer to it as getting out, getting up on the wrong side of the bed or feeling blue, or maybe somebody's dealing with some postpartum depression or, uh, grief, um, you know, depression from grief or loss, all these things can be on the spectrum and everyone's experience is unique. Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean that an illness is present, though. We'll talk a little bit about when, how um, to determine if an illness is present, but here's just some statistics, just a few statistics. Basically, one in five people live with a mental illness, and one in 25 will live with a serious mental illness. And um, what you see detailed uh, below, schizophrenia, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, these, um, I think seven of them, them that are here, these are really what's looked at as the major mental illnesses. So um, this is what, it, what it says up there is what affects our mental health. And um, stress, adverse child experiences can, genetics, of course, we know that there's a genetic component that's certainly the case in my family, there's a strong gen genetic component, um, your physical health, um, and also environment and lifestyle. So when we talk about environment, I just have a really short video clip here I wanna share with you all, um, because it really is, um, environment can be at home and beyond. Every day, we get news about the health effects of extreme weather, like heat waves, floods, droughts, and violent storms. But we hear a lot less about the effect on mental health. 48% of Americans today believe their mental health is currently affected by climate change. They're right. Climate change can have short and long-term effects on mental health. Heat waves contribute to violence and suicides, and people who take psychiatric meds need to watch their heat exposure. Trauma from natural disasters starts with the immediate stresses of lost homes, pets, and physical injuries. Over months, financial problems and social disconnection can contribute to depression, PTSD, alcohol and substance use, irritability, insomnia, and even domestic violence and child abuse. Slower moving weather events like droughts or coastal erosion have impacts that contribute to long-term chronic stress, including high levels of anxiety and depression. Children, older adults, the chronically ill, migrants, and refugees are even more vulnerable than most of us. So how can the negative psychological effects of climate change be reduced? There are a lot of solutions, but one is to build psychological resilience, which is boistered through social support and connection. For more, please visit www.psychiatry.org. So that's just a quick um, little uh, video about climate change in, in particular, but you know some of the other things when we talk about environmental at home and beyond, um, you know, it's it's easy to think about people having mental health issues and, and, and mental illnesses when they, you know, maybe come from a home um, where um, there's substance use disorder, domestic violence, maybe they live in a bad area in town. Um, and um, so it's it's a little easier to imagine that, but, um, and we'll talk a little bit more later too about some of the other things that may impact the environment. Um, in addition to climate, things like climate change, we have um, mass tragedies that happen, war that's going on, um, and, um, you know, the anxiety and upset that that, uh, per that pertains to that. Um, social media, um, I actually just saw tonight on the news that, um, you know, their Congress is trying to get, um, you know, some some more um, 
uh, you know, social media to do some more things about online bullying and kids who are uh, vulnerable to being taken advantage of. Um, so those are also environmental things that can have an impact. Um, and here's the hard thing about um, mental health conditions and mental illness is, you know, this is what anxiety looks like. This is what anxiety can look like. Um, you know, certainly we get a picture. Um, we can we can all probably conjure up a picture based on social media, on social media, um, other types of media, um, uh, news of a person who is very ill and very symptomatic um, with illness. Um, but there are far many more people who um, who walk around every day, um, living well in recovery. And you would have no idea that they're, um, you know, dealing with a, a mental illness, that they may be taking medications or they may be, um, you know, having seeing a therapist um, once a week or, um, you know, engaging in some other sorts of treatment. So this is really important, um, you know, to remember. Here's some of the, um, you know, the uh, kind of warning signs that somebody might be dealing with a mental health condition and um, should potentially seek some assistance for it. And this is if these sorts of things, you know, go on for an extended period of time and create a situation where the person is, you know, it's disrupting their life. Um, you know, there it can sleeping too much or too little, feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness um, is a is an indication that um, they may be at risk of suicide. Um, weight loss or weight gain, poor concentration, loss of interest in activities. Um, and so, you know, if, if you, um, you know, we always, uh, let people know that if you, you know, you're, uh, have a friend or a family member who is constantly, um, or consistently saying, you know, I can't make it to this because I'm not feeling well, but they don't have any other physical issues. It could be that they're dealing with a mental health condition. Um, mental health conditions also, um, can, they will begin to manifest themselves or can manifest themselves as, um, physical, um, conditions. There could be muscle tension and pain, insomnia, um, gastrointestinal issues, chest pain. Um, they're common in panic attacks. I have a family member who we've, um, you know, until we, until we realized that, she was having panic attacks and um, and got her the correct treatment for it. We ended up in the emergency room several times because she literally thought she was having a heart attack and the symptoms mimicked a heart attack. So, um, you know, these things can be really um, distressing for, for people. The other thing is, is that people who live with chronic illness, mental illnesses, especially depression and anxiety, it takes a toll on the body. It really, um, it, it changes um, things met metabolically for people. Um, they, um, you know, that same relative of mine who um, deals with panic attacks, she lives with um, major depressive disorder. And if, if there's something going around, she picks it up. And um, what her doctors have explained is it's the body can, you know, it takes a toll on the body to live in a consistent um, state of anxiety and depression. And so it's really important, um, you know, to pay attention to these, these things and understand that um, people living with those diseases have increased risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, pain, Alzheimer's. Um, and, uh, people who live with severe mental illnesses, um, continue to die up to 25 years on average sooner than, um, than people who do not live with mental illnesses. Good news though, is it's treatable and, um, there is no cure for mental illnesses, but it is treatable. And, um, there's many things that can um, improve the journey of recovery, including medication, therapy, coping skills, social support, and education. We heard that in the video. 
um, you know, that those are really important things to being able to combat some of these things. And the the education, the support, the understanding healthcare options, that's where NAMI really can come in and help. Just a few, uh, a couple slides about youth that I have, um, because one of the things we really advocate for at NAMI is early intervention. When I got into the field of mental health back in the 1980s, um, we used to not treat people until, usually, until they were over 18, and often until they were in full-blown psychosis. And so that would be like knowing that somebody has cancer, but waiting until they're stage four to start any kind of treatment. And so the, the you know, in doing that, um, what we were, what the mental health services were doing was it really people were kind of behind the eight ball in terms of um, treatment and being able to catch things early and, um, and uh, have a better prognosis, a better outcome. So we really advocate for um, and and try to help parents understand what some early warning signs are and how to get help um, for their kids um, as soon as possible. Um, so you know this what this slide says is why are young people struggling? And um, you know here's just a few of the things adults are their adults in their lives might be struggling. Um, their exposure to adversity um, and pressure to conform with peers, media influence, gender norms, um, quality of their home life, violence, um, especially sex, sexual violence and bullying, um, socioeconomic problems, stigma or discrimination, and lack of access to quality support and services. Um, one of the things that about bullying that I've heard some um, young people um, talk about and parents talk about is when I was growing up, I would adventure when, you know, when we, when we were all growing up, most of us, right. We did not have um, social media. And so if somebody was being bullied, they were being bullied likely in school or in the neighborhood and they could come home and get away from their bullies. Home was a safe space as a general rule, right? For somebody who was being bullied maybe by other kids. That is no longer the case. Bullies come into people's, you know, kids' homes now via the internet, via, you know, via text, via chat, via, you know, all of these um, ways that, um, that we communicate with each other now. And that really is taking a toll on um, the mental health of our young people. So, um, you know, addressing mental health really is is urgent. Um, most um, mental health issues will start to exhibit themselves be by the time the child is 14 years old. And if they are not addressed, kids drop out of school, they use drugs, they um, they can, uh, you know, they will um, potentially engage in risky behavior um, and be at risk of suicide. So how can we support our, our, whoops, sorry about that. Let me go back here. There we go. How can we support youth mental health? And, you know, really, you know, anybody dealing with mental health issues is, you know, understanding how to talk about it, reducing stigma through vocabulary and accurate medical information, um, helping people understand the warning signs and um, so that they can help each other or a friend, providing those important um, youth uh, resources and especially resources specific to youth, normalizing discussions, um, supporting uh, parents and caregivers, and really helping to provide access to care and support. And then um, let's talk about suicide. A lot of people don't like to talk about suicide, but it is something that needs to be talked about directly and um, and very uh, frankly, because that is what's gonna reduce suicides. 46% of people who die by suicide had a known mental health condition. And, and the others 
um, you know, that's that's a big amount that um, what is that 64 percent who did who were not diagnosed, um, but many of whom probably had mental health issues they were struggling with, but nobody knew about them. So, um, you know, we have some risk factors here and also some warning signs um, that, um, you know, there's you as a general rule, somebody who is thinking about suicide will give off some warning signs. They may be subtle or they may be really direct, but some of the more subtle ones are saying things like, I wish I wasn't here. Um, there might be increased substance abuse, withdrawal from family and friends. Again, that risky behavior, giving away possessions, kind of, um, you know, settling affairs and saying goodbye um, are all things that, um, you know, could be warning signs that somebody is thinking about um, suicide. And here's the here's the biggest thing. If you know somebody who struggles or you think that somebody may be struggling, you see warning signs, talking to them is not going to um, increase their risk. So um, what we really talk to people about is um, those who come to our classes and our support groups is, if you're worried about somebody, ask them the question directly. Are you thinking about taking your life? If you can't ask it, find someone who can. And uh, just as an example, you know, one of my staff was really worried about her son when he was in his late teens. She could not bring herself to ask the question, him the question. She teaches other people how to ask the question, but she could not herself bring herself to do it. So she engaged her sister um, to help with that. And that was really, really important because they found out that he was in fact thinking about suicide. And so they were able to get him the help he needed. Number one reason that people do not seek help is still because of stigma, shame, and fear. More of us talked about it and realized that we're not alone if we didn't keep our struggles invisible, then stigma would not be perpetuated. And what I can say is that one of the silver linings of um, of the pandemic is is that a spotlight has been uh, is has been shined more directly on mental health issues. Money has um, you know come in various forms from um, federal government to state government to city and local governments to support mental health initiatives. Um, and that is very encouraging. Coping skills and strategies, we all need them. We also found during the pandemic that there were, um, you know, a number of people that we served that, um, you know, they could cope very well, often without medication, because they had developed coping skills for themselves. Maybe somebody was dealing with some mild depression and, um, you know, they worked out every day, but then when the gyms closed, they couldn't work out every day, or maybe they lost social connections and we saw people really start to suffer. So, um, one of the things that NAMI does is we teach people coping skills. We educate regarding um, regarding what mental illnesses are. We help people understand practical next steps. And we do those things for um, families and the individual living with the mental illness, but then we also do it for the community because stigma will cease to exist when we have communities that are accepting of um, mental illnesses as they are any other physical illness. So here's some of the resources and I, I really want to, I included um, these particular ones because I wanted to help um, the group understand that there are three tiers to NAMI. There is a national organization, there is a state level in I think all but one state, and then there's a local level. And so um, if we look at, um, we go to the national website, this is a very easy place to go and look under support and education. You can find your local NAMI here. 
and they have a map that you can go to and simply click on your state. Sorry, I got to keep moving you guys around here. And then it will give your state organization and then all the local NAMIs. So you can really look by county. And so, um, you know, if we're looking for NAMI Southeast Wisconsin, then it's going to um, take me here and then can take us to the local website. I just simply clicked on the state and then it brought up the state of Florida and has all the geographic areas where there's a NAMI. And you can simply click on one. We'll do Palm Beach County here, and then it'll take you to their local information and their local website. And then from there, you can navigate what kind of resources you need, what kind of groups they have, and all of those things. So you'll really be able to navigate some of these um, different resources, but there's a navigating a mental health crisis guide. There's a national resource directory that's 111 pages long. Um, so I really encourage you to, you know, go to those websites and, and look at what um, resources are available at your local NAMIs. And again, utilizing the state organization as maybe kind of a starting point um, and particularly if you are living in a county where there is not a local NAMI. 988 is, um, is a number that is a three-digit number that you can call from anywhere in the country. And if you're in, it does, it's not just for suicide. It is if somebody is in a mental health crisis, family member and friends can also call. The, the number will actually be, depending upon where you're calling from, it will be answered in the state you're in. So for instance, in Wisconsin, our 988 um, call center is in Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is up north from where I am in Milwaukee. And, um, but what that 988 um, and Crisis Lifeline can do is they will be able to, um, they have mental health counselors on, that can ans that answer the phones. They can, um, they can help triage the situation. They can get you in contact with your local crisis. It is an, it's an easy number to remember so that you don't have to be thinking about, okay, um, you know, where do I call for this crisis or, um, you know, how do I get a hold of this hospital? They have all those resources in one space. You know, the biggest thing when we're, when we're working with people is, um, and, and really getting past that stigma piece is you know, working with people in, in, um, from a place of empathy as well. Um, so that, um, you know, we often hear people dealing with mental health conditions say, I don't want your sympathy. I just want you to have, you know, to have some empathy or some understanding maybe for what, um, I might be going through. And that is the end of my PowerPoint. So any questions? One, uh, a uh, member of our uh, audience here has asked about taunting in a workplace. Yeah, and so obviously that can happen as well. Bullying, harassment in the workplace. Um, those, um, those issues really are such serious human resources issues. And, you know, m most organizations are taking that very, very seriously. Um, so those are things that um, I know in our organization, we have a policy on harassment and bullying that really puts everybody on notice that we will not, we will not tolerate it. And if anybody is, um, is overhears it, that it is also their responsibility to report it to human resources so that it can be dealt with or to a supervisor of their choosing. So, you know, I think making sure that for those policies are clear. If you um, are supporting somebody who feels they're being bullied in the workplace, encouraging them to go to human resources um, and talk to them if they can't talk to a manager um, and just making sure that that gets um, you know, called out and um, dealt with immediately because it really <clears throat> uh, is something very, very serious that can have 
um, obviously, uh, it can it can have an impact on the person, on their mental health, also on their work productivity, on the workplace in general, um, if bullying is going on. Okay, we have a, a viewer who is uh, Steve Mandel. I believe he's out in the East uh, Coast, New Jersey, New York area. Steve, I believe you raised your hand. Yes, so uh, NAMI has trained facilitators those with lived experience. So could you describe what is the training for a lived experience facilitator? How does NAMI identify and train that person? And then mm -hmm. when that person is running a group, what is their role? Great question, um, Stephen. And I see there's also a question about NAMI family to family. Um, and I'm so I'm going to try and wrap these both into one because I'm going to use NAMI family to family class as an example. Um, so the national organization um, really is the owner of um, the NAMI signature programs like family to family, which are evidence based programs. And they are uh, meant to be um, presented by um, by volunteer family members. So as a family to family member, I would have, um, first I would have gone to the class before I could even be considered to, um, to be a volunteer. It's an eight week class that um, provides family members with information about mental illnesses, um, resources, they do problem solving workshops, they do um, communication workshops, um, they help um, the family understand how to best support their loved one in recovery and how to get them to accept treatment um, in the first place. Because oftentimes, um, you know, individuals don't want to recognize that they're ill or accept treatment for it. So I've gone to a family to family class as a family member. Um, I'd like to be a facilitator. I'd like to give back to families. And so I um, will uh, work with the local NAMI to apply. Um, there's an application process. The local NAMI has to approve this person going for training. And then um, if I get chosen to go to training, the state organization, so for me, that would be NAMI Wisconsin, holds a um, training that generally goes um, it varies um, for different programs, but for family to family, we're using that as an example. It starts um, on a Friday afternoon and goes until a Sunday. And so it's an, an it's a weekend long training where the per, the information is um, taught to the um, the individuals who are going to be facilitating it. They're taught how to um, run the workshops. They're taught how to um, facilitate the group, manage the group, um, help people understand um, rules of confidentiality and um, deals with any um, kind of hot potatoes, they call them, um, if you will. Um, somebody who maybe is coming into the class in, um, in you know, the family's really in crisis and how do we help them and those kinds of things. Um, one of the things that, um, that we, uh, once the person has gone to training, um, then that to that formal training with, um, the state organization, then they have to come back. Um, they come back to the local organization and they teach, um, the class or facilitate the class with a seasoned facilitator. So we might have somebody that we match up with somebody who's been facilitating the class for five years so that then they can, um, you know, uh, see how they're facilitating the class and um, and help, um, you know, uh, kind of get mentored by that person. One of the really important things about the materials that come from uh, NAMI National that are evidence based is they have to be presented to fidelity. So we we get a curriculum. We are not allowed to change it. Our facilitators are not allowed to go off script from the curriculum. There are times during the class where um, people are sharing their personal stories um, or when they're doing the problem solving or the communication workshops, you know, that there is, um, you know, there's uh, room for um, more 
more specific um, types of situations. But the curriculum itself has to be done, um, you know, to uh, to the T. Um, otherwise, the class isn't considered evidence based anymore um, because we're not teaching it the way that it was meant to be taught. Does that answer your question? And I have a second question. So you're tonight speaking to the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, and could you address NAMI FaithNet? Yes. So NAMI FaithNet is, um, and we, so right now we currently are not offering NAMI FaithNet at my organization. Um, we we did, um, prior to the pandemic, we had um, a pretty good FaithNet um uh, curriculum happening. And basically what NAMI FaithNet is, um, I should back up and say, we do offer it in, in other ways, but not use, using utilizing their curriculum right now. NAMI FaithNet is a curriculum that is used with faith leaders to help, um, or can be used with faith leaders to help them understand um, you know, really what NAMI is about so that they can help their, um, you know, their communities, their faith communities with accessing the NAMI um, materials and um, resources. And so we were, um, prior to the pandemic, when we were doing a lot of in-person um, uh, presentations, we were doing um, all day um conferences, so to speak, that were faith net conferences where we were bringing faith leaders together from, um, you know, from all different faith communities throughout southeastern Wisconsin. And um, but um, we we aren't doing that curriculum right now. Other NAMIs are doing it. Um, we're um, doing more like what I'm doing tonight where um, and what I did in, in January, where we go to a specific faith community and then we tailor the, um, you know, the presentation to what they're really asking us, um, you know, to teach about. A colleague of, uh, of mine from my congregation in the Chicago area. Uh, Stan, would you like to uh, address the group and, and ask your questions of Mary? Yes. Thank you, Mary, for coming all the way. <laughs> I'm from CCNS in Illinois, so I appreciate what you're doing. And my question to you, it's in the chat, has to do now with AI. Is NAMI looking now into the influencers that are on AI through TikTok and unfortunately affecting mentally ill type people who are on this journey? and thereby influencing them, causing more depression, which they really don't need. And it's something we obviously are gonna be living with pretty quickly the way it looks. Has yeah. NAMI looked into that at this time? I So I don't know what the national organization is doing, but I can tell you that I, we actually, I actually just um, had a staff person register for a conference, uh, or actually it's a workshop about this so that we can educate ourselves more about this. And um, because, um, but that is a really good question um, about, you know, is the national organization looking into this at all, you know, for um, for the organization, you know, nationally? Um, I don't have the answer to that question, but I know that we have had a lot of family members come to us and say, um, you know, my loved one sp spends all their time on the internet going down these rabbit holes of, you know, uh, conspiracy theories and, um, you know, they're being bullied by somebody, they're um, connecting with, um, you know, kind of weird chat groups and, you know, things like that. And, um, and so we're really looking at, you know, how can we as an organization help family members to be able to help their loved ones, you know, not, not do this. And, um, you know, again, I had re referenced what I saw on the news tonight with, um, you know, it was actually Mark Zuckerberg uh, was the person who got up and did anybody see him tonight? He apologized oh, yes. To, yes. Yep, to, to the family members who had lost loved ones. Mm -hmm. And yet, 
but the the reality is is that they can't get any of this legislation pushed because no. you know because of you know the lobbyists and you know all of those things so the safeguards continue to not be there it's really distressing okay, so i'm sorry to? i don't have a better answer for you than that other than to say I know at a local level, we're looking into it and I would hazard a guess that they are also looking at it from the national level. I, nothing's come down to us from that level though yet. Well, thank you for answering and also thank you for putting the climate impact in there because that's very important as well. I, we you know, thank you're welcome. And I didn't mention that I actually got that. It was on the APA website. So the American Psychological Association, there was additional information there. Um, they have a position statement. And so if, you know, anybody wanted to go and do some further, um, you know, looking at that, that is a place that I, you know, that where I've been finding information about it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Mary, could you explain uh, the source of funding for NAMIs? Yeah, absolutely. So it, you know, it really varies um, greatly. And many NAMIs, um, I, I mentioned briefly that, you know, there can be really some, some big size differences in NAMIs. There are some NAMIs that are still being run all by volunteers. They have very low operating budgets and, um, and they do really great work, but they, it might be hard for them to have, um, you know, significant mission impact because they just don't have the resources. And so, um, if you look at a uh, NAMI like NAMI Southeast Wisconsin, we're what's considered a full service NAMI. That means we or offer all the signature programs and then a bunch of programs that meet the needs locally. We have a very diverse, diversified funding um, source. We um, certainly rely heavily on donations and grants um, and um, contracts. We have a state contract, we have a federal contract, um, we also have um, contracted services through our local health and human services in each of the counties that we serve. Um, but um, we have to raise a significant amount of money every year to sustain our programs. Going into, um, you know, in, into our, our year, every year we're looking at, we have to raise about 50% of our $2.2 million budget every single year. That's not contracts that we have um, already, um, you know, where we've signed on the dotted line already. Many NAMIs will do a, a NAMI walk and that is their income for the entire year. And so, um, so that um, that's great. Um, but what I saw happen in Milwaukee with NAMI Milwaukee is that they relied for many, many years on their walk income as 80% of their budget. And guess what happened when they couldn't have a walk in 2020? They almost went under. So, you know, putting all the eggs in one basket, um, so to speak, is really, really hard. And I know that NAMIs that are having walks now are really trying hard to diversify funding um, because many people learned a really important lesson um, when you couldn't have that in-person, um, you know, walk and fundraising component. Um, but we do not get any money from the national organization. We do not get any money from the state organization, nor do we give them money for any sort of franchise fee. NAMIs are their, most NAMIs are their own standalone organizations. So I, I generally say if every other NAMI went away tomorrow, we could, we could still be here as our own 501c3 nonprofit, non-stock corporation. Maybe they wouldn't let us use the NAMI name anymore, but um, you know, we could still, uh, you know, function as an organization. Okay, thank you. One of our viewers uh, recently participated in a uh, NAMI walk and he reports it was a wonderfully positive experience. Uh, when we introduced uh, Mary at the outset, uh, we referenced the fact that she helped secure a three-year grant to establish the United for Waukesha Resiliency Center in Waukesha, uh, Wisconsin to support the victims of the 2021 Waukesha Parade tragedy. Uh, Mary, could you kind of uh, 
take us into uh, uh, how that uh, process uh, ensued? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, and this is, you know, one of those environmental factors, right, that we, that I talked a little bit about. So we had this, you know, terrible tragedy that happened um, and a number of people lost their lives. Many, many more were hurt. Um, we had 78 uh um, first responder agencies that responded to this. So we had many, many people suffering there and really just the community in general suffering. And um, and so the Office of Victim um, Assistance, um, you know, came to the community and said, basically, look, there's federal dollars that are available um, to, you can create a resiliency center. It's a, it's a two to three year grant and um, really help people heal from this tragedy. Make sure that they're getting connected to the appropriate mental health resources and um, give them a, you know, give a center, have a center where they can come to and, and experience healing through support groups and, um, you know, music therapy and art therapy and, um, you know, all kinds of, um, you know, different uh, mental health uh, treatment modalities, um, both traditional and um, more holistic or, um, you know, non-traditional. And so um, we were asked, um, we were invited to apply um, for this. Um, being um, in, in Waukesha, we are the only uh, mental health um, organization um, uh, of, our, of our type where we're not just connected to one specific clinic. We're, we provide services for everybody in the community. And we were chosen um, by the steering committee to um, manage that grant. Um, in fact, we're just going into uh, year two of that and have been able to um, provide services um, for more than 350 um, people, including um, a number of first responders who were able to access mental health treatment um, through us and get get it paid for by the um, by the grant. Uh, we also talked about uh, the involvement that you've had experiencing with uh, homelessness, et cetera. Yes. Uh, is it too early to say what uh, your involvement might be in addressing issues associated with migrants? Um, it's a little too early for us, although that is something that we're looking at. Um, we're looking at it right now um, because there is Whitewater, which is um, in in um, Walworth County, Wisconsin. So uh, it's it's they are um, I think they they are dealing with 450 um, immigrants who um, came into their small community and they don't have a NAMI. So they've reached out um, to us for some assistance with that. And so we are just starting, um, you know, with that process and seeing what we might be able to do to assist them. Other oh. NAMIs though, across um, the, the country are probably dealing more um, uh, directly with it. Um, I know San Antonio, Texas, um, is dealing, many of the NAMIs in Texas are really dealing with, um, you know, uh, working to support individuals and support the community, quite frankly, because it puts a great stress on the um, on the communities as well. And so I know that there are NAMIs that are um, doing that. We just haven't um, started that yet. I would like to suggest if anybody has, has a NAMI, like we did it in our NAMI, we went to the police and we talked to them so they would not, they would understand the importance of people walking the street and not just put them in jail, but actually take care of them. And that's something you have to be aware of. Uh, we did that in Lincolnshire, Illinois. So I'm just suggesting that for those people who do have NAMIs to look into that idea because it's very important today. Thank you for that, Stan. You reminded me that many NAMIs across the country, and, and our NAMI is, um, we have a very robust, it's crisis intervention training, CIT, for law enforcement. It's specifically for law enforcement. It's really to help them understand um, how to de-escalate a crisis if they're able to, um, if they can safely do that without using use of force. And, um, and NAMIs are... Um, really involved in this because 
we bring people to the training who have lived experience, either family members or people living with their own mental health conditions to help that, to help humanize them really, and help them understand, um, you know, how damaging it can be to have a bad interaction, um, you know, with police officers, damaging for the family, damaging for the individual. Um, And then of course the um, issue of homelessness as well. Um, you know, that, um, you know, those things being uh, mentally ill or uh, experiencing homelessness are not crimes in of themselves. Um, and but but perhaps um, those individuals have um, committed a crime, but it's it's due to their mental illness or, um, you know, they're experiencing homelessness and to look at those things a little bit differently and try to get people help and the resources they need as opposed to taking them to jail or using force. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, wrap things up, is there any uh, interaction, uh, Mary, with NAMI uh, dialogue taking place through this type of medium, through Zoom uh, interviews or therapy of that sort, uh, or is it all in person or? Um, No, so there are a number of virtual um, options that are available. And actually there is, if you go to the NAMI national website, there are, um, you can look for classes and support groups. And I was on there the other day and I, I hate, to say that the national website is not as up to date as as I would like to see it. And I don't think that's their fault. I think it's the local organizations not keeping them up to date. But if you go on there, it will tell you um, what classes are available in person, what classes are available virtually, um, support groups that are available virtually. And you can connect. I know that for our NAMI and many of the NAMI colleagues I know, if we have a virtual support group and somebody wants to connect to it from California, they are more than welcome to do that. And, um, you know, also, you know, for in-person stuff, we don't say, oh, we only serve these three counties, so you can't come. If somebody wants to come to one of our um, you know, events or classes or whatever. Maybe their local NAMI doesn't offer it. Maybe they're not offering it in time for what this family or individual needs. Then they can connect. They can really connect anywhere. Does Does NAMI offer a service whereby if an individual uh, needs to uh, have an interpreter or someone speak a native language that that is offered or? They, well, they should be, I'll, and I'll say they should be because it's it's going to be up to each individual NAMI to do um, really what's right. And so we have we work with a language line. So if somebody comes in and doesn't speak English, they can you know they can point to on a poster to what um, you know what language they speak, and we'll get somebody on a language line to help interpret. Um, that we do um, a fair number of um, of services for Spanish speaking, um, and so you know, obviously, we're able to navigate that. But um, you know, if somebody came in and uh, spoke Hmong, you know, we wouldn't have anybody that could speak to them, but we would get an interpreter on the line. And um, what we do often is we will work with partner organizations. That to see, you know, if they, if, um, you know, an organization that is providing services in their language can meet their needs. If not, then we figure out how we can do that. Is it having some things translated, um, you know, teaching a partner organization how to facilitate NAMI groups or education classes in their language and, you know, those kinds of things. Okay, thank you. I think on behalf of Uh, The Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, I know we're very appreciative of your wonderful presentation this evening and the time that you've invested, and we look forward to continuing a working relationship uh, with uh, NAMI Southeast Wisconsin. Uh, I'm a little biased uh, being in the Midwest, but uh, hopefully we can establish uh, contact and rapport with NAMIs all over the country. Uh, The FJMC has this inclusion committee. It's amazing about how much FJMC offers and how much is available. Uh, And we had a conversation with uh, Steve Sturman this evening, who's the chair of that committee. And uh, we should all look forward to uh, the activities 
and plans of that committee moving forward. So we thank you for joining us and stay tuned uh, and keep looking at the website, the FJM's, FJMC website for uh, highlights and news of uh, upcoming programs. Thank you for joining us. Have a good evening. And uh, we'll see you on the next FJMC webinar. Thank, thank you for the thank opportunity you. to present. Thank you, Mary.